Okay, our journey from Kansas has, has taken us deeper and deeper into the land of Oz. We're now going to talk about inductive reactants. We talked about capacitive reactants, and now inductive reactants. Why? Lots of biomedical applications. Um, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, TENS. I'd never heard of it until I was preparing this lecture. Uses low frequency AC electricity and can be used in pain control following suspected nerve damage. So you're just running a current up and down uh, this person's arm to try and control pain. All right, this is the same concept. Everything is the same in the statement of the concept, except these two words, purely inductive. So now we're going to do a, a circuit that has an inductor and an AC source. And we want to know what that circuit does. The answer is that the voltage and the current are again out of phase with each other and they're 90 degrees out of phase with each other. But which one reaches its peak first, the voltage or the current? And remember that this is the direction of increasing time, time getting longer, later and later and later. So I want to ask which one gets to its peak first. So in that sense, I'm going to go opposite, backwards in time, until I find the one that reaches its peak first, and it's the voltage. And then the current reaches its peak later. So in this case, instead of the uh, current leading the voltage, the opposite is true. The current lags behind the voltage by 90 degrees. Again, that same amount, because they're, they're both offset by one quarter of a cycle. And the constant of proportionality is called the inductive reactance. There's the constant of proportionality, and here's its form, 2 pi f times l. You say, well, that looks a lot similar to the um, capacitive reactance. And I say, yes, it does. Instead of having 1 over 2 pi f times c, you've just got 2 pi f times l. And one of the amazing things about this math for the what we call the RLC circuit, uh, that we'll talk about in the next section, is that, and, and for this inductive reactance, is that this combination of units, a frequency measured in hertz, and an inductance measured in Henry, that those two units combine together to form what looks like a resistance measured in ohms. So the inductive reactance is measured in ohms. And it's x with a lower k, x sub l. This l indicates inductive, because l is the unit that we, l is the symbol that we use to represent self-inductance. And x represents reactance, inductive reactance. How does this inductive reactance depend on frequency? And you say, well, wow, there's a frequency right there. The inductive reactance is proportional to the frequency. So it's linear. It's a line. This looks like y equals mx plus b, where x is the frequency, and all this, the 2 pi l represents the slope. And so it's just a straight line. The inductive reactance comes up as a straight line. So it's just the opposite, the capacitive reactance. Instead of being high for low frequencies, the inductive reactance is low. And instead of being low for high frequencies, the inductive reactance is high. So inductors and, and capacitors have an opposite role as a function of frequency. All right, so what else do we have? Purely inductive circuit, the uh, power. Average power is zero, and I think you can guess why the average power is going to be zero. The reason is these are out of phase, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and they'll cancel each other out. So the average power for that circuit is going to be zero. 
directly proportional. I think we've covered everything on that slide. An inductor circuit, a purely inductive circuit, operates at a frequency of 120 hertz. The peak voltage is 120 volts, and the peak current through the inductor is 2 amps. What's the inductance of the inductor in the circuit? All right, well, we've got a peak voltage of 120 volts. We've got a peak current of 2 amps. And we want to know what the inductance is. We know how the RMS voltage and current are related to the inductive reactants. And what is that relationship? The RMS equals IRMS times the inductive reactance. And we know what the inductive reactance is. It is 2 pi F times L, the inductance measured in Henry's. But the weird thing is that we're actually trying to find L here. We've got the frequency, it's 120 hertz. And the other weird thing about this problem <coughs> is that we have the peak voltage and current, and we really need the RMS voltage and current. And you say, well, no problem, Dr. Edwards, I can handle that, no problem at all, because I know how to relate the RMS to V naught and I naught. So let's actually rewrite this equation by substituting in VRMS is V naught divided by the square root of 2. So this equation becomes V naught divided by the square root of 2. IRMS is I naught divided by the square root of 2. So remember, the RMS voltage is less than the peak voltage. And the square root of 2 is a number that's bigger than 1. So you take the peak voltage and divide by a number that's bigger than 1, you'll get something that's less than the peak voltage. Is I naught over the square root of 2 times XL. And let's go ahead and plug in what XL is here. We've got that equation right here, 2 pi F L. Well, now a miracle occurs. We can multiply both sides by the square root of 2, and we can solve for L by dividing both sides by this uh, amount here, 2 pi i naught times 2 pi times f. So this will be v naught, whatever is on the left side, divided by this mess on the right side. I naught times 2 pi F. And that'll give me L. And that's what I want. V naught is 120 volts. I naught is 2 amps. 2 pi is 2 pi. And the frequency is 120 hertz. Happy day. What do we get out of the deal? Well, the 120s cancel each other. Uh, we got a bunch of units, and the hope is, if we work it out, that they'll come out to the units of inductance. What are the units of inductance, self-inductance? Henry. And so we could check that, but we're not going to today. We've got a 2 here, and a 2 here, and a pi here. So that's going to be 1 over 4 pi. Henry. And 4 pi, what's 1 over 4 pi? Um, 4 is 4, pi is around 3. 4 times 3 is around 12. 1 over 12 is going to be something that's a little bit uh, less than 0.1, maybe 0.08 or so. And sure enough, uh, we have an answer here. You can plug the numbers in, but you'll get uh, 0.08 Henry. 
Okay, we're going to uh, define the phaser. Phasers are similar to vectors, but they are particularly useful in these um, circuits that involve phase lags and phase, um, phase gains and lags. Define phaser and describe its length, vertical component, and direction. A phaser is just an arrow, like a vector that rotates with frequency f. So let me do an example. This is in the case of a purely resistive circuit. This graph on the upper left-hand corner is for a purely resistive circuit. The voltage phaser, this blue arrow, starts from the origin and comes out, and its length uh, represents the peak voltage. And this blue arrow rotates around, let me do it with this, rotates around with a frequency f. So it's, you have to imagine this rotating around the, the origin of coordinates with a frequency f. So if this were for a household circuit, it would be doing this going around 60 times every second. Then it's used to represent current or voltage, in this case voltage. Its length is the peak current or voltage. So that's what we talked about here, V0 being the peak voltage. And its vertical component is the instantaneous voltage. So this vertical component here is the So this vertical component of it is the voltage as a function of time. Well, what happens is that as this vector approaches the, the y-axis here, then the voltage as a function of time will be high and positive. When it comes down to here, the vertical component will be zero. So the voltage is zero. Down here, when the phaser is down here, the blue arrow is down here, the voltage will be negative. And then, and so on. I think you get the idea. That represents the sinusoidal motion. And it's actually related to the idea that we talked about the similarity between uniform circular motion and oscillatory motion, simple harmonic motion. We showed last semester that an object moving in a circle, if you turn that to the side and just look at it from the side, it looks like an object in simple harmonic motion. Same deal here. We're just taking this vertical component to represent the time-dependent time component. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Its vertical component is the instantaneous current or voltage, and its direction, instantaneous meaning time-dependent current or voltage. And the direction relative to other phasers gives their phase relationships. All right. For the purely resistive circuit, we've got a voltage phaser and a current phaser, denoted here by the red arrow, that are pointing in the same direction. And you might say, well, why are they pointing in the same direction? And my answer is that the voltage and the current in a purely resistive circuit are in phase. There's no phase difference between them. So that's why we put these two phasers pointing in the same direction for a purely resistive circuit. You say, I think I'm starting to guess what's going to happen for capacitive and inductive, and you'd be right. So for, for a purely capacitive circuit, we've got a voltage phaser in this direction, and that's just a snapshot at a particular time, and a current phaser that leads it by 90 degrees. So these two are rotating around. They always, always maintain that 90 degree relationship with each other and rotate around with the current leading the voltage. Okay? Pretty cool. And then what about a purely inductive? So this is purely capacitive.
circuit. This is resistive. And then this is purely inductive. Well, in that case, as you remember, the current lags behind the voltage. So if this pen here is a voltage and my finger is the current, the voltage is ahead. It's always ahead as they move around the circle. And the, uh, so the current lags the voltage. What do you mean by lags? I mean just is behind the voltage. 